gracias. Hello. Hello. Good good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Matter. My name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. Uh, we're going to get started with our program. I apologize. There are a number of you um, who are standing. We had a record turnout uh, for this event. Um, there are some seats in our uh, classroom just across the hall if you want to watch the uh, live stream of the event. Um, welcome to those of you who are watching via live stream. We had a number of people uh, register that way. Um, so Matter, for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with this place, we are uh, an incubator and an innovation hub focused entirely on developing healthcare solutions that can solve um, really meaningful problems in healthcare and solve those in the right ways. We opened two years ago and work today with uh, about 200 um, startup companies in healthcare and about 70 uh, large partners, including big companies and health systems and universities. And one of the things that we like to do is bring in um, speakers who can talk about and give a perspective on some of the most interesting aspects of healthcare today. Um, today, we happen to have two of uh, the two of the most prominent physicians probably in the world. Um, we have uh, Dr. Jim Madera, who is the CEO for the last five, almost six years of the American Medical Association. Um, who has been a great partner of Matters really since the beginning, um, has been serving on our board of directors, uh, and many of you have taken advantage of the AMA Interaction Studio, uh, which we have thanks to the American Medical Association. Um, and we have Dr. John Noseworthy, who for the last seven years has been the uh, CEO of Mayo Clinic, um, joined Mayo Clinic um, about 26 uh, years ago and became the chief executive about seven years earlier. I'm very fortunate to have them here. Um, and uh, we will, I will get out of the way. Um, we'll end the program at one so that you can get back to work and really appreciate you all uh, coming out and spending a little bit uh, of the middle of the day um, with us. So with that, I turn it over to Dr. Madera. Thanks very much, Steve. I, you know, I have to say that I'm really lucky to have Dr. Noseworthy here for the Q&A. So I just ventures. So uh, I really appreciate you folks joining, joining today. So. Uh, I said, Jim, give me about five minutes. I'll just set the stage a little bit about Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. And we have a network of 46 uh, uh, subscribed members around the world who basically provide Mayo care at a distance using our digital tools. That's a different topic. Um, Mayo Clinic, a national and international destination medical center for complex diagnosis and treatment. So we focus on complex and serious illnesses, and patients come from 150 countries and all 50 states. Uh, so that's where we focus. We do family practice and so on for the region. Basically destroyed the bottom half of his, of his face. Um, we've cared for him for 10 years. His psychiatric situation is stable, uh, and uh, he was ready to embark on this. And Results are really stunning. We didn't announce it when we did it. We wanted to announce it when we knew we had a result that would actually change the field, and we think we've done that. Um, that would be one example. Uh, another example might be, again, just innovation, that unlike any other hospital in the country, 18% of our operating rooms at any one time have two different teams of surgeons operating at once. That just, it should happen everywhere in the country, but for a whole lot of reasons, it's really hard for orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons and plastic surgeons and head and neck surgeons all to work together. So this is just the way we've been perfecting this team-based care for 100 years. In our research and discovery side, which is your part of the world, uh, essentially um, we use a discovery to translation to application and commercialization uh, 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 configuration. So we take what's we discover or others discover, but very quickly, or as quickly as we can, invest in how do you get that into the practice. The reason we do research is to meet the unmet needs of our patients. And so it's very much a rapid cycle, as quickly as we can. We internally fund 
that valley of death between discovery and commercialization through our profits and through our uh, gifts from our benefactors. Um, we've doubled our research commitment, our own money, uh, into this initiative in the last 10 years at a time when the NIH was flat. Our research budget is about $600 million a year. Uh, we've innovated, pardon me, we've invested in three major centers in the last five years. One for genomic medicine, and you, all, you know all about that. One in regenerative medicine to bring regenerative biology to the practice. And the other, kind of more mundane, but really important to the work that Jim and I do, engineering science. How do you engineer the healthcare experience so that it's safer, faster, and so on? Uh, we partner with large companies that the darn thing. <laughs> but essentially, this is, this is the scorecard of what our business development uh, team have succeeded in doing. Uh, and this is a 30-year uh, history. 43% of our disclosures have been commercialized. I'm told by... years, uh, but now I hear the numbers up to over 200, but that's sort of some idea of what we do. It's returned to Mayo Clinic about a half a billion dollars, and it's impacted tens of millions of patients' lives. So that's kind of a roll-up of what we do. We're trying to do it faster and, and turn that off and put on a, a short video that I thought would be, you might enjoy. It's about three minutes. Set the stage for this. Patients with psychiatric disease, and this focuses on depression and psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, about 50% of those patients don't respond to medications the first time. And to speed up the uh, getting the right dose, the right drug, we've been using the pharmacogenomic uh, profile to make that happen. And uh, this video will uh, show you how we've sped that process up again through a company and it helps patient care. So this should be the video. There's an important story here, and it really starts with the late David Morasic, with colleagues Dick Wenzelbaum, John Black, and our collaboration with Mayo Business Ventures. There was a goal to develop technology to help better individualize treatments for patients uh, with depression. The problem with antidepressant therapy in this country circa 2016 is that it often takes several weeks to a month or two to have a full therapeutic response. GeneSight is a pharmacogenomic decision support tool that was developed at Mayo Clinic in collaboration with our business ventures, and it is a product offered by AssureX. It's really meant to be a guide for clinicians and their patients to better identify or allow greater precision in how we choose antidepressants when treating depression. We know from our clinical experience that we enhance treatment adherence rates, that patients are more engaged in their treatment, they're more likely to take the treatment. We see response, getting better faster, getting back to work, getting back to their families. That's a great example of how technology can make a difference in practice. The idea was a clinician who saw a need to innovate their practice and was able to do so in a culture that valued innovation in medicine, Mayo Clinic, and specifically with collaboration with uh, our business venture group. So we do work with drugs, and biologics and devices and diagnostics and all forms of technology to improve the lives of patients. That's what you do, that's what you're interested in, that's what you're committing your lives to. And we're always, we're open for business and looking for more partnerships. So with that, Jim, I'll John, pass it over. what a wonderful introduction. I, you know, I, I do um, probably have to start. You know, four o'clock last night when we were all sleeping, uh, <laughs> we're our good folks at the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, were awake and marking up a bill. Four, I think it was 4 a.m., wasn't it? <laughs> Not 4 p.m. At least I go to bed after 4 <laughs> <laughs> So um, you might 
want to just touch on um, your thoughts about this. So Jim's referring to the American Health Care Act, as you know, and uh, I'm going to pass it back to Jim because he was up at, there at 4 o'clock, they, <laughs> they were reading Jim's letter from the AMA, right? Um, so we're in a situation in this country where uh, we're trying to figure out how the government's role in health care. Uh, and this act that uh, Jim and his team, I, I really do want Jim to speak about, um, is not going to be, uh, I, I suspect, approved in its current format. Uh, the Democrats hate it, half the Republicans hate it uh, for various reasons. It's either too conservative or not conservative enough. So it's, um, I think our president said the other day, healthcare is surprisingly complex. Who would have ever thought it sort of thing? So, <laughs> so I mean, I, I, think that's a, I think that was a direct quote. And, and, it, <laughs> and it, is, it is very complex. And, um, uh, but again, I, I don't mean to make light of it. There's nothing more serious than healthcare. And again, you all know a great deal about it, and you're all trying to help us do a better job to produce better health care at lower cost that's affordable for patients and accessible for patients. Um, uh, and Jim, I think the AMA has actually come out uh, seriously with concerns uh, that this bill will reduce the, the number of Americans who are covered. And maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah, so um, we're in such a dynamic circumstance that we focus on sort of long-term principles because the dynamics of the day-to-day -day, uh, one can hardly stay up with. Um, I haven't checked my Twitter feed in the last half hour, so Lord only knows how the environment has changed. Uh, <laughs> and so our principles are really that, uh, based on the fact that we know people that don't have coverage and access live sicker and die younger. And we've decided we're against people living sicker and dying younger. Uh, and therefore, we should not roll back on coverage. We should move forward on coverage. Uh, we also think that special attention needs to be given to the most vulnerable among us so that if there are tax credits, they should the size of those should be inversely related to income. Uh, several other points, I'll make one more, that if there is an approved provider, an approved licensed provider, we don't think the federal government should decide for a patient that they could not use that provider. Uh, so for example, we have providers in the Planned Parenthood uh, uh, network. Uh, why should the federal government uh, say that that subset of approved providers? So for um, these reasons, we're partisan. We look forward to working with and just Senate to support the, the value-based healthcare um, approach. It's highly complex, it's in its infancy, um, and there's a lot more work to be done. We're investing, in, as I mentioned, in engineering science to try to figure out how you recognize value. But it's really important to all of you folks, because the work you're doing, the output of that work will ultimately, we hope, will be rewarded through your innovations. Patients got a better outcome at lower cost, and that's value, and you should be reimbursed for that innovation, and we need it. And that's where we're headed. Our focus, of course, is to, rec if, if, if a doctor gets a diagnosis correctly that hasn't been made before, or if a surgeon says you don't need a surgery, there's a non-surgical way to go forward with that, instead of penalizing those institutions that do that, they should be rewarded, and that, that learning should be passed to the rest of the country that you don't need to operate on this kind of situation and not be penalized for it. So again, this value-based thing is, is really critical, and it's terribly important for all of you. In a 90-minute face-to-face that, that I had with others, although somehow the people at Mayo wouldn't be surprised, I ended up doing a lot of the talking of the, the other three or four that were there, but a very direct conversation with President-elect Trump, it was the week after Christmas, was about investment in innovation. And the point we made, and his team took up on it, we'll see whether it'll uh, deliver anything, but was the importance of the investment in discovery science, which has been underfunded a lot the last 10 years. So there's an ecosystem there of discovery science. Young people can, can go into uh, life sciences, the biological sciences, medical research, and so on. But what's missing, at least on the government side, is that translation and commercialization of the output of that, which is your world. 
And essentially, the case I made very directly with him, very precisely with him, and he heard it, was that that's, if America's going to be the innovation engine in this 20% of our economy, we need to make sure that we're funding innovation, commercialization, driving new jobs, um, new firm creation, and basically improving our global competitiveness through the work that you do along with the basic sciences and the engineering sciences. That was a very specific point that he and I talked about for five or seven minutes, and his team came back and heard that. To the point that we said, if you look at the NIH, that part from translation, application, commercialization is absent in the NIH, and that $32 billion a year doesn't invest in that. That's fine, but there are many foundations that do. The private sector does it. Uh, benefactors help us do it. Industries do it. Uh, healthcare organizations do it. But it would be sure nice to have the government recognize its importance because what you're doing uh, uh, will change the future and will, will help our patients. And it's good for, good for the economy as well. So that was a pitch that he heard very directly from me. And I believe very much in what you do. On about four years ago, when we were surveying physicians in multiple markets, um, one of the observations was that the tools that are produced uh, for physician practices often have a sound theoretical base, um, but sometimes lacking the granular knowledge of what happens at the physician-patient interface. And so you have this complex uh, system engineering problem uh, into which over the transom is thrown uh, a tool that imagines things operating more like a linear manufacturing process. Uh, and that's what the AMA interaction uh, space here at Matter is about. You must uh, also, in a physician-driven uh, organization like yours, have thought about this granularity of knowledge that's needed for innovation. Could you share some thoughts on that? Well, it's, a, it's, it's surprisingly complex, isn't it? It's, uh, as they say. <laughs> so I think, you know, you could take that down any number of, any number of uh, directions. And Jim, I'll, I'll give a short answer, and hopefully you can come back. But understanding that space between a physician or other provider and the patient and what adds value and what is just traditional is really important. Um, you probably know this, but for every hour a provider, a nurse or a physician spends with a patient, they spend two hours managing the regulatory environment. So people say, why is healthcare in the United States so expensive? Why do we spend so much money and have ordinary outcomes? A big part of that is the regulatory burden, which it, it all sounds fine, but every regulation that is added, nothing else is ever taken away. It's kind of like my attic. You know, there's room for one more couch, but we never take anything out, away from it. And if you're going to, if you're going to actually st strip this down, uh, we have to find a way to say what matters, what makes a difference, what adds value, uh, pay for that, and take the rest away. So there's a ton of work that needs to happen there. Um, and again, with President-elect Trump, I said, you're, you know, you want to deregulate the financial services sector and the energy sector, please deregulate healthcare, because it's killing, not only killing the profession in terms of burnout and young people not wanting to go into medicine, but it adds enormous costs, there's huge opportunity for fraud and abuse, and it makes the system completely unable to innovate. I mean, you can't do telehealth in a patient's home. You have to do it in a medical office of some sort. I mean, who wrote that bill and why? That might have sounded fine then, but why can't that be changed? You know, go on and on and on. So we, the American Hospital Association, I don't know, maybe the AMA, has basically said, what are the, what are the key regulatory things that can be removed without making healthcare unsafe? If you, if you don't, and again, this, this may affect you a little bit. I'm sure you've, if you're in the pharma side of life or the device side of life, there's this huge urge to remove the proof points of the FDA. And we know what that does. If drugs are said to be helpful, or they help these five people, let's let everybody get treated with it, uh, we're going to be in a real mess because a lot of patients respond to medication, but when you do an appropriate trial, it was just chance. And so speeding up the FDA, there's some things that we could do to, to take that away, but let's be careful. You want to make sure if you're being put on an important drug or having a procedure, that it's been shown to be safe within a certain range and what to watch for and, and whether it works or not. So again, deregulating, but carefully. Again, surgically, you're a pathologist. You want to, you want to make sure we do this in an analytical way, not, not, uh, not too hasty. 
So, but go back to your the complexity space and what's the AMA doing? Can I ask you that about this? Because I because sure. I mean, you just explained it to me and it's it's just fascinating what the AMA is doing uh, in the space. Maybe with some of you. So a couple of things. One is um, getting through uh, integrated health model, uh, a coding set that can be probed by machine learning, and doing that to all coding sets, and then developing functional markers. Uh, so one can start defining this field like other fields are defined by the output rather than the inputs and see what the series of inputs are. Uh, having that would also allow interoperability since those codes are the basis of all the information that one would want to extract uh, from a record of a, any kind. Uh, secondly, creating a pipe for information liquidity. Uh, and that is being built on the model of the SWIFT system for international secure banking currency exchange. Uh, so we get those two things together. Uh, I should say that um, I met with the medical directors of all the talk about prior authorization. Uh, that's an example. Uh, uh, Why I pay my dues. <laughs> AMA. Glad you're doing that. So prior authorization is an example of, um, in a survey where physicians uh, will spend, in the physician's office per physician, two days of time with prior authorization, handling about 35 of those a week. Um, you need some prior authorization for safety concerns. It's probably not right-sized. Uh, my, my sense of the plans is they think it's just perfect. Of course, uh, yeah. <laughs> Slow, it slows down the billing process and slows down the care process. So to the extreme, if you look at the VA system, I actually ended up telling, I keep coming back to this, but um, the president said, could Mayo Clinic um, scale up its care of veterans? And we said we would be pleased to do so, but there has to be a, a, a business model to do that because we get paid about 30 cents against our cost to care for veterans. And I said, the veterans we care for, and we do about 20000 a year, we do a charity care because you can't possibly deal with the regulations of the VA. You have a sick patient, and everything has to be approved. The patient doesn't get great care because you wait a day, you wait a day, whatever it is. So, I mean, this is completely out of control. And I, 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 I'd, let, I'd love to help you with that one any way I can. I mean, that's, we really need it. Well, the, the, they ended up being... Um Wanting to collaborate, which was good. Uh, it didn't start out that way. Uh, Thank you. I, 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 we, we have on the iPad here some questions coming in from the audience through uh, a method that I'm completely unaware of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I assume these are people that are paying that have the code. Is that right? <laughs> uh, uh, so here, here. <laughs> open for business. We have hundreds of collaborations in the international space. That leads us, again, why would we come back again to what's happening in the political arena? But the political arena affects us all. Um, so we have 20% uh, of our staff, give or take. I wasn't supposed to use numbers because someone will print that and maybe it's 19%, but it's you know one in five, something like that, of our staff come from different lands. That's the Mayo Clinic, it always has been. And we get the best and brightest from all over the world and we wanna hire them. So we're working to make sure we can continue to do that. Um, and the international um, collaborations are vast. Uh, uh, if there's value there, uh, most of these are one-on-one, -on -one, one physician research lab or one program with another. But some of them are more systematic. We have a great relationship with the Karolinska, for instance. For 30 years, we've been working with them, and we have multiple projects with them. We're doing more with Oxford. So there, there are a number of those opportunities. But we welcome those kind of opportunities for collaboration. Question asking your thoughts on automation. And, you know, do you see a trend to lower end jobs disappearing? Uh, will we be in a, a robotic physician world? Uh, what are your thoughts on automation? Thanks. Um, well, I think, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's amazing what robotics are doing for the practice of medicine. And, and, and it's, on the more mundane, forgive me if I'm saying something offensive here, on the way lab specimens are processed, pathology slides, all that kind of thing, the robotics there are just incredible to run through millions of samples and so on. No error rate, uh, very precise and ever-changing. 
and the human genome in a week, that sort of thing. So, I mean, that's huge. That's sort of um, behind the curtain. Uh, in the operating room, uh, many surgeries now are being done robotically, as you know, or with various levels of that. I mean, the idea that you can replace a diseased heart valve without cutting the chest open is unbelievable. The fact that you can do that just through a catheter in the, in, in, in the leg in a 90-year-old patient who's in really bad shape. Um, uh, the opportunity to remove, probably the biggest, any of you have done medicine, one of the biggest surgeries, conventional surgery, is something called the Whipple's procedure, where you basically spin the gut around and take out the pancreas, and it's, it is the most complex surgery that a general surgeon would do. We have a surgeon at Mayo who's done over 450 of these uh, uh, um, non-invasively, just through you know, one centimeter incisions in the abdomen. Uh, and the outcomes are spectacular, and the patient goes home in two days, not in three weeks. So, I mean, the chance, the opportunity there is just amazing. In terms of putting radiologists, I guess, would be one that's come up. Will we, ever, will we still have radiologists reviewing x-rays, or will they be reviewing the puzzles that the, ex, that the ro robots haven't sorted out? I think that's a real possibility. It's not really robots, it's AI, it's other things. I think that's a real possibility. I'm not sure that we'll be at the stage where we will replace the nurse or the physician asking the patients what's wrong with them. So far, those methods are pretty crude, and the physical examination, we still, sometimes that's still helpful. It's not all imaging. Uh, but I do think the extension of the knowledge of that physician, if it's built well, and we're doing that, lots of others are doing that, through um, cognitive computing, will be uh, uh, wide open. Um, so what should the doctor be thinking about with this set of circumstances? It shouldn't be on the back of an index card from nine years ago at medical school. You know, it should be, it should be that chip that's for, for up, up, uploading that. So those are some of the things that immediately come to mind. Uh, there's a possibility that surgeons will be more able to do surgery separated by hundreds of miles. And that's really important for the developing nation. It's important for rural America. There's a lot of that stuff. So the field is wide, wide open. One of the things I would build on that you said, I, I, you know, I absolutely would agree with the way you characterize it, is that sometimes in clinical medicine, when we talk about AI, uh, what we're really talking about is IA. We're talking about intelligence augmentation, uh, not a complete substitution. Uh, Provider. Another question um, has to do with how you link the innovation with the operations. Uh, how do you create that bridge in an efficient and safe way? Um, so I think it's hard, to, it's hard to adjust an ecosystem that's set up not to do that. It's possible, and that's, I'll just say, Again, forgive me for the information, for the inform infomercial here about Mayo, but Mayo has been set up as a partnership for 100 years where folks who join Mayo Clinic recognize they're basically checking their own independence and ego at the door. They can still have a great career, but they're here to do one thing, and that's to serve the patient. Whether they're a teacher or a, a pathologist, they're there for that purpose. And so teamwork and sharing is part of what we do. And so at Mayo, it's very easy for the discovery scientists and the clinicians to be hand in hand. And they come together and say, okay, what's the biggest issue in this particular condition that you're working on? What is the unmet need of the patient? It's a diagnostic test. Or as we saw here, it's a way of screening drugs that will work from drugs that won't work for this individual patient. And so that, that teamwork of everyone working together across that spectrum, and you can imagine in your world, it's the discovery scientist and the engineer creating the application for that particular need. That all comes down, in our opinion, to ask what is the research question or the technology question you're trying to ask? What's the unmet need? What do we, what do we need here? And then how do we build it up across that chain of expertise? So it's hard enough to do it. It's really hard to ask those questions. Um, uh, and it's, it's hard enough to do it if you're the engineer at this end, but if you don't have that link, um, it'll take 10 or 15 years longer. So we think, well, why, why have those barriers? Why not just essentially be a partnership? So that's what we try to do. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the, the success in, in uh, startups and spin-outs internally. 
from an external point of view, are there examples of startups that have created a meaningful business relationship with Mayo uh, successfully? And uh, could you talk about that? So I'll, st I'll start with that, and I'll ask Jim or Andy to, to kick in. Um, I think one of, the, one of the really important ones would be the Cologuard story, and you've probably seen that on the advertisements on television, but detecting colon cancer is the second l leading cause of cancer death in America, and um, it's completely, nearly completely preventable, um, and 40% or something of the, of the population at risk won't have a colonoscopy. They either can't afford it, they don't like the idea, or they live in a, in, a, in a part of the country where that's very difficult for them. And so essentially, working together and spinning out this company, uh, Exact Science, uh, with our molecular biologists and physicians, working together with them, created a DNA-based test that's basically, you submit a stool sample, that's it. And it has the same screening value for a surgically important colon cancer as a colonoscopy. You can't remove it, because you then have to go for a colonoscopy. And last week, the report just came out that a, using a, a, a blood sample, we believe we're on the path to diagnosing lung cancer from a blood test. So again, everyone's working in this liquid biopsy space, but exact science might be where I would go, Jim. I don't know what you were thinking. No, I, I think that's a great example. Another great example is probably Nevro, which was a company that was formed outside, but also used the know-how of Mayo and the Mayo clinicians to treat chronic back pain. And then maybe a slightly different flavor is we, are, we understand that we need to look outside as well as inside. So another example of a kind of a collaboration we have that's kind of unique and gets to some of the points that uh, our, both our panelists are talking about is a collaboration we have with uh, Boston Scientific where their engineers are actually working shoulder to shoulder with our clinicians, understanding and identifying problems that our clinicians are having and then working on solutions that can go into Boston Scientific's uh, product flow or that we can separately spin out. So we're very interested. We, we know there are gaps. You know, gone are the days when we, can, when we can say we can do it all by ourselves, and gone are the days when we want someone coming to us and throwing something over the fence without the clinical piece to it. So we need to partner to fill these gaps, to bridge these gaps, and get the best ideas to the patients. Thanks, Jim. S someone wants to know, um, given the role of quality metrics in value-based healthcare, what was the rationale of the AMA spinning off the PCPI, which is an acronym for organization of many uh, of our medical subspecialties uh, that produce these quality measures? And the answer to that is because it was mature. Um, we're still giving it financial support. Uh, quality measures are important to us. Uh, we still give some housing support. Uh, we set up a foundation so it can have its own income uh, flowing in. Uh, but basically, this has been the history of the organization with AAMC. And, uh, we set up a certification process for medical schools, spun that out uh, when it was mature. So it doesn't show a retrenchment in the quality area. It shows what we would view as a successful birthing of uh, an independent quality initiative. So this is difficult for me to read, John. Physicians are, physicians are notorious for being sluggish to change. You said it, Jim, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I've lost it here. No. Um, so how do you yeah, the, the answer is yes. Is that how do you engage providers to uh, adopt, adapt, and engage? Well, change is hard. I, I can tell you physicians are, are, um, are slow to change. Um, I suspect that's, we're, we're not the only species that are that way. I mean, it, change is hard for everybody. Um, and I think yelling at them doesn't work. I know that. I think they have to see the, the, the importance of the change. Uh, and depending on how comfortable they are with where they are, the harder it is to change. And essentially, and, and many of you know this, if you're the CEO of a company whose industry is being completely re-engineered, you're basically a change agent. If you're not good at that, uh, the next person hopefully will be better than you because you won't stay in that job terribly long. And so, again, I'll just hate to personalize it, but that's uh, you're going to hear it. 
when you come to Mayo Clinic, which has been one of the most trusted names in healthcare forever, uh, to tell our salaried physicians that the world is changing very, very fast, and this is unlike anything they have ever seen uh, in their life. And basically, there's going to be an enormous downward pressure on our revenues. Uh, could be as much as 2 to 5% per year. Does that matter? Yeah, that matters a lot, that kind of thing. And what does that mean for us? Um, it's hard for them to see it. And, and, and physicians basically are, um, by and large, uh, uh, service-driven folks. I heard about a young woman today, a high school sophomore young girl who wants to be a physician, but she'd like to be a biomedical engineer first. And her father said, what should I do? And I said, just get out of her way. I mean, can you imagine what two degrees would be? I mean, there are lots of combinations, but that's a fan, just a fantastic combination for a woman to be an engineer and a physician. And she, I just know that person is going to have just a, a spectacular trajectory. She's preparing herself well. Um, but um, essentially, physicians go into the field to serve patients. And it's hard work. It's, it can really be very, very stressful uh, with what you need to deal with, the disappointments, the personal crises in the patient's lives. Long hours, student debt, all that stuff. And you were trained to be an individual, and you were trained by people who you respect, who did it this way. And you can't see beyond the success of what you've been doing. And the idea of doing it differently than that is very difficult. And so to introduce change in that, it's that... It's that what, what future state are we talking about that has to be appealing to them and they also have to feel the burning platform under their feet and recognize that this is going to be good for them and good for, more importantly, good for their patients, but good for them as well. And when you can sh help them see that and engage them in that, you will go faster than you can go alone because you'll have all those committed people who see that. But until they see that it's going to a better place and it's necessary for their patients and ultimately for them, it's very hard to move them. Yeah, let me add to that just by pointing out that we did a, two studies collaboratively with RAND Health nationally, multiple markets. And the question was, what, what is it that drives physicians' uh, satisfaction? And on the other side, you know, what, what gets in the way of that? And the satisfiers, number one, two, and three, were all the same thing. Um, time with patients and feeling that you had enough time to really interact with the patient doing a good job. Uh, the dissatisfiers were all the things that gotten away with that. Um, so it was really time with patients, other things including money were way down the list. So John quoted uh, another study that we did in, in collaboration with Dartmouth uh, where we demonstrated that for every two hours for every three hours of a physician's life, one hour is in front of patients, two hours are data entry and administration. So you have a group of people that have trained, as John has outlined, uh, they're passionate about their patients, uh, they view their primary satisfier as being with patients, and you say, go, go do data entry and administration for two-thirds of the time. Uh, and this loss of meaning is what's driving this a uh, new um, and debilitating uh, feature of burnout uh, that is happening uh, with physicians too. So finding a way, um, our own meta signal, our meta goal is to, with the various approaches and tools that we're developing, save an hour a day from every physician that that physician can go back to seeing patients. That would be the equivalent of adding 100,000 physicians to our workforce. And I was on a panel with Andy Slavitt a couple months ago, um, uh, the, the previous director of Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And Andy uh, was asked by someone in the audience, with all of these ideas, what is one idea you have that you're most certain would produce better outcomes and better health care? And what Andy said was, if you give time back to physicians to spend more time with patients, that's the only thing he was really sure about. You know, you're, you were, well, I shouldn't say this, I don't know any of you, but, but my, sense is, my sense is, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an, if you're an inventor, it's all about change. Physicians, 
some of them are very inventive and very creative, but they supplement they 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 overcome that with their or they, they the dominant thing for them as Jim has said is the other. So you're change you love change, and you have cool eyeglasses and funny shoes and you do all sorts of techie stuff. I mean that's just your world. It's very different from the world of the physician. So, but what what that's where you get your joy. You get the joy, the buzz. Out of look, this look what we've just done, and this is going to ma make a difference. Physicians, so you know where your joy in work comes from. It's a very different joy in work than a service-oriented physician or nurse. So, if we're going to change them to move faster, higher, stronger with your help, they have to see that same joy that you have and the output of what you're doing. Because once they see it, physicians are very data-driven. Data once you show them that with your help, you can help them do a better job with their patients. They will, they will change very quickly. They're slow to change because, and there's a reason they're slow to change. They were told that this electronic health record was going to make patient care safer. It was going to make their lives better. And instead, they see it. It's not completely fair, but they see it as basically removing all the joy in work. And so next time you come along and say, well, how'd that work for you? I got another good idea. You know, they're going to dig in. They're going to dig in a little deeper. So your job as inventors and entrepreneurs is going to be, I think, if I were giving you any coaching, would be how does this improve the joy of work of a nurse or pharmacist or a physician or, or a surgeon, whatever. And you do that and they will be, they'll be all over you. Adding um, an aspect where I think entrepreneurs and physicians share, and it's really important to think about this in your products, um, is what are the incentives? Are the incentives external, extrinsic, uh, you know, bonuses for physicians? Um, uh, or are they intrinsic? And in most complex cognitive fields, entrepreneurship, uh, physicians, the individuals are driven by the intrinsic incentive. And the intrinsic incentive you all see here uh, people staying late at night, you know, really focused on their question. The intrinsic incentive of physicians is time with patients, uh, trying to do a good job. So that is, uh, that is shared. Now, one of the uh, things that has happened in medicine is that classical economics got a hold of the programs before behavioral economics came along. And so you have these penalties and rewards that are relatively small, and what the literature in this field shows is that if you take uh, an individual who is complex cognitive tasks uh, driven in intrinsically and you create an extrinsic reward, you actually complicate the, the performance of the individual. So I think this is also an important consideration you know, when you think about your products, uh, you know, who are you going to align with? Um, what are the incentives to uh, engage your products? Uh, are they, and which pathway should you go? Classical economics, behavioral economics? You get two different answers. Uh, John, you mentioned uh, cardiac surgery. Boy, I, they don't miss a beat here. You mentioned cardiac surgery on a 90-year-old. Uh, do we have a cultural and ethical dilemma in the U.S.? What medical care makes sense in light of outcomes given a patient's age, comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that's, again, that's a question I can't really answer. Um, I'm a physician, and I lead a physician-led organization. And uh, if a patient's sick, uh, we believe they should be cared for. Society is going to have to decide, and many advanced societies have made those decisions about rationing health care. You can't get a... When, when we started doing kidney transplants, uh, 31 years ago, um, children weren't allowed to be, children weren't being transplanted in the country. People said you can't transplant children because it's too big an investment. I mean, if you can imagine how far the field has gone. And uh, I must say, when I moved from Canada to Mayo Clinic 26 years ago, I was surprised that 90 plus year old folks were having carotid surgery to prevent stroke because we wouldn't have done that in Canada. I'll just tell you, we wouldn't have. Um, uh, and they do it all the time at the Mayo Clinic. I don't think they operate on people. In fact, we don't operate on people that shouldn't be operated on. But if you, if you bring a sick patient to a physician or a nurse, they're going to care for that patient. 
But if society decides that one way to deal with the rising cost of health care is to ration health care, then all the more reason for your profession, for your life's work, is how do we find a way to provide care that can't otherwise be provided because someone won't pay for it. So I, again, that's out there. I don't know what the answer is. Getting back to the change, if I can, just there's a, ter- a really good story, I think, and I'll try to tell it quickly. Um, probably six years ago, the cardiac surgeons at Mayo came to us and said, uh, we need three more operating rooms. We said, why? And they said, well, we have a waiting list. And we said, well, we don't invest in an unimproved process. Go back and re-engineer your process. And they said, BS, we bring a lot of money into the organization. And we said, thank you for your, go by. that's fine, but we have the money, so you decide. Um, <laughs> basically, re-engineer how you work. Well, the cardiac surgeons, I mean, they work hard, they work lo- terribly long hours, they're incredibly gifted, they're completely committed. All they want to do is operate on more patients because that's what their life's work is, and they do it well. We said, go and work with this team of engineers and go re-engineer your process. And off they went, and they came back and said, um, we've re-engineered our process. Uh, we want to hire three more cardiac surgeons. And we said, how many more ORs do you need? Well, we don't need any more ORs, but we need more surgeons because we, we're using the ORs differently. And they took that data that they learned with their engineering workflow and all that stuff to totally change how they, how they work. And... Again, in, in my world, in the ecosystem of medicine, I mean, I don't mean they're gods on the, but, you know, Olympus or whatever, but when cardiac surgeons embrace data-driven engineering change, what do the rest of you do? You say, well, they're, we better do that as well if we're going to get resources and so on. So again, um, they're slow to change, but they're slow to change until they see the data. And they see the data is better for patients, and then they just run to the front of the line. And that, that'll be, you, you know this if you work with docs, that'll be the key in nurses, that'll be the key thing. You show them that what you do make, makes life better for patients, and they will, they'll come running to you. Palliative care, end-of-life issues, very sensitive, big cost driver. Could you share your thoughts in this area? Yeah, it's a big cost driver. I think... Um, um, there is more work that can be done there, but I think preparing for end of life when it's not, there's no need to do so, but long before it happens, is obviously the best thing. I see a lot of head nodding, that advanced directive, that critical conversation with your sister, brother, son, daughter, uncle, father, whatever, so you know, and everyone around that table knows, and your brother knows what dad told you, and you have that conversation, it totally changes the end of life and makes it meaningful and even celebratory, as sad as it is. If you don't have those conversations, uh, you probably know the situation you're in. And it's intubated, it's months in an ICU, it's, it's human suffering, it's not what the patient wanted, but son and daughter, mother, father didn't have the conversation. That's only part of it, but it's a huge sink. It's, I can't remember, Jim, the percentage, but if you take Medicaid spending, it's a big chunk of that particular part of a very, very big chunk of our, of our GDP is spent on this, and it's mostly families. It's mostly sociological. It's not breakthrough technology, but it's critical conversations. These are sensitive areas that um, we actually tend not to pay a lot of attention to, enough attention in this country, as you point out. Another one I, I was thinking about earlier, uh, you discussed the pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid being complex neurosurgery, uh, and the like, uh, and the bottom of that pyramid being more public health measures. Uh, it's interesting that if you look at the OECD data, as everyone knows, our costs are far ahead per person uh, than the other countries in the OECD database. But it's equally interesting when you look at that same database and you look at safety net and the bottom of the parent mid, uh, we are dead last. And another way of looking at this that has been expressed a couple of times is that if you go to countries like um, the UK, there is rationing of health care, but it's at the top. You know, if you're a certain age, you're not going to get your transplant. Uh, whereas, whereas in the States, uh, we do ration, but we ration at this safety net level, at the base of this pyramid. Uh, does that make sense to you as a concept? 
Uh, I think it's accurate. I think it's wrong, but, but accurate. And, you know, prevention, and again, this is not Mayo Clinic's sweet spot. We don't do a lot of public health, and that's not our area. Uh, but that's an area that's grossly underserved in this country. And um, again, that's a question for the citizenry. Do we care about that? Do we care about school literacy? I mean, all these things really matter. You know that. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. Uh, but our, 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 our country could make some different decisions and have a different, uh, and, and be in a different place if we made that as a country. It's rather polarized, as you know. Just so people are aware, it's also, um, there was a preventative fund as part of the Affordable Care Act that was administered by the CDC that's built up to about a billion a year uh, and has been used, for example, the uh, tapped into for the Ebola uh, scare a couple of years ago and whatnot. And, and part of the um, plan currently in Congress also uh, takes that away, uh, that preventative piece away. Speaking of money, how about drug pricing? So um, complex area, again, uh, not an area that we work in specifically at Mayo. Um, but I personally think, and I think uh, Mayo would agree, that curative drugs for serious diseases should be appropriately and competitively priced. Um, probably the best example is the hepatitis C story. And the idea that, sure, it's $80,000, and you can, it's, it usually isn't quite that much, and they're fighting out how to, how to improve their market share, and the prices have come down considerably. Um, but curing a patient with hepatitis C who's destined to have a liver transplant and liver cancer is probably a pretty good deal. Um, other things, the generics, uh, the Me Too drugs, not so much. And, um, and I think that's a, a, an area that's, um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Again, I don't think there's a simple answer, but I think if you put it on a value curve, that's pr a pretty good way to start. Uh, and I'm hopeful that cool heads will prevail and that'll happen. How, how much does the periodic loss, unavailability of routine generics that seems to occur? It's interesting. It's, it, it's, it's surprising. These ordinary drugs that are generics, you can't get them. And you say, what, they're out of chlorthalidone, a, a, a drug that's been around for 40 years, but someone needs it to prevent kidney stones? Me? Um, what do you mean you can't get chlorthalidone? <laughs> This is not, a, it's like a, a penny a pill, not so much anymore. So again, the, pro, the manufacturers dialing back, um, there, there are many examples of these. I mean, running out of um, anticoagulants, you can't run out of anticoagulants, you can't run out of vaccines. This just can't happen, but it happens, and it shouldn't happen in America. So again, an opportunity for solutions. When you think of a group like this that's, thinking of what they can add to the quality of health care. Uh, what, what do you tier as the lowest hanging fruit in your mind? Oh, goodness. Well, um, uh, maybe not low hanging, but the biggest puzzle is the obesity epidemic. If you could help us with that, I mean, the world's your oyster. We've got it. That's, that is probably, I think, the biggest opportunity in, in developed countries and increasingly in underdeveloped countries. And it's complex and it's not, these are not bad people, but they need, they need help and we need to find a way to solve that because of its association with everything that goes wrong, including cancer with people. So that's, that's probably the big opportunity. Um, the wearables I think are, are curious and interesting. You know, many of you work in that area. I think on the preventative side that Jim mentioned, public health and other preventative things, decisions people make and so on, you just have to be, and it's hard for, for you, being in, inventors, you're going to have to be in there for the long haul for a preventative behavioral thing. I mean, you can spin the company out, but if you're really going to change human behavior, that's really hard. Um, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think is the best, the lowest hanging fruit? I actually think the you know the eighty percent of the three trillion we spend in chronic disease, and it gets to these metabolic syndromes, yep. hypertension, uh, type two diabetes, uh, obesity. Um, I know Margaret Chan 
uh, made the point as head of the World Health Organization uh, recently that if you look at other countries that um, develop economic efficiencies uh, and industry and then convert to Western diets, you start seeing these Western diseases manifest themselves. And in China today, it's estimated 50% of the population is now uh, pre-diabetic. Um, although, interestingly, they tend not to get obese. Uh, but they have the same metabolic syndrome. And economists who have looked at what this means to society, if that's not prevented as conversion to type 2 diabetes, uh, estimate that all of the efficiencies of the buildup of the Chinese industry will be lost uh, to this disease burden. Uh, it shows you how important these things are. We're at the top of the hour, and so let me ask this the final question. John, what, what don't other people know about you? Uh, that would be... <laughs> what, would you, what would your family say if they were here? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I didn't invite them. <laughs> um, no, I'm just, uh, kind of a private family person. Um, uh, wonderful wife, two kids. One's a electrical cardiologist, you know, does ablations, and the other one's a professional musician. He's the lead guitarist in a band called Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zero. Some of you have heard of that band. Uh, and he writes film scores. Um, so, and we have a dog, and that's kind of the story. <laughs> Well, they also have a really interesting father, so let's thank John for this hour. That was good. Thank you. What a great opportunity.